I am with Dr. Katerina Harvati. She is a paleoanthropologist specializing in Neanderthal paleobiology. Um, in case I'm not saying everything right, I will let her tell us about her work um, and what's the progress that's been made. Yes, hello, good afternoon. First of all, thank you for this invitation. It's a pleasure to uh, meet you and to participate virtually in this very interesting uh, event. So yes, as mentioned, I am uh, Katerina Harvati. I'm professor for paleoanthropology at the University of Tübingen, and my work focuses on human evolution, specifically on uh, Neanderthals and the paleobiology of Neanderthals. This means the biology of an extinct species, um, but also on the origins of modern humans, so the origins of people alive today, ourselves, our own species, Homo sapiens. Um, so this field is very exciting. It's, um, it's seen a lot of uh, progress and a lot of uh, breakthroughs in the recent years and, and decades. And particularly my work actually uh, focuses, a large part of my work focuses on uh, Southeast Europe and the Eastern Mediterranean as, um, and the role that it would have played in human evolution. So uh, it is my hypothesis and my belief that this region played a very important role, not only because it is at the crossroads of uh, continents, so the three continents meet there, Europe, Asia, uh, and Africa, uh, and this would have allowed for population movements between these different geographical areas, as we see even still today. Uh, but also because, uh, for example, Southeast Europe is one of the three major southern peninsula of Europe. And this means that even during the ice ages where climate, the climate and the environment would have been uh, not uh, very nice, it would have been impossible for human societies to thrive in more northern uh, parts of Europe, so in Central Europe and Northern Europe, Southern Europe and particularly the Mediterranean parts would have still been uh, able to uh, foster uh, human presence. So we have uh, a lot of exciting possibilities for a kind of, uh, um, uh, let's say, refugium. This is a kind of refuge for uh, not only plants and, and animals, uh, but also uh, extinct human species that would have perhaps survived during these difficult times in, uh, in, in the southern parts of Europe and specifically Southeast Europe. So my work recently has been um, um, reached quite a breakthrough uh, with the reanalysis of uh, fossil specimens, human fossil specimens from Greece, from southern Peloponnese. So this is a site called Apidma in the Mani, Mani Peninsula. And this is where we were able to show indeed that not only do we have a presence of Neanderthals, it's quite strong presence in this region uh, during the middle Pleistocene. So going back uh, 150 or 170,000 years before today, but also that uh, we have evidence for uh, the earliest uh, migration of our own species, Homo sapiens out of Africa uh, around 200,000 uh, years before present. So what we uh, have been able to identify there is the earliest Homo sapiens fossil that is known outside of Africa. So this is very exciting and we're, we're really uh, excited about this find and it's of course it also fits with our hypothesis of the very important role of the Eastern Mediterranean uh, as both uh, a, a corridor, a migration corridor, but also a place where you could have uh, populations thriving throughout time. And uh, I look forward to more exciting discoveries and uh, more work in the region. We are also waiting for your work <laughs> to um, learn these fascinating things. Can I ask a few questions? Of course. Um, Neanderthals are not a um, homo sapiens um, pre species that came before it. Okay, so what is the relationship between Neanderthals and our own species, Homo sapiens? This is a very 
good question and one that also a lot of scientists are working on. But, and in the past, for example, um, there were many different opinions. So are they perhaps part of our own species or are they uh, distant relatives? How are they related to us? Are they ancestors of, of humans living today? So it turns out that it's um, the answer to this now coming from a lot of uh, evidence we have both from the fossil record, but also from paleogenetics. So ancient DNA, um, is that indeed they are very closely related to us. They are um, our sister species, so to speak, but they're not the direct ancestors. So they're not the direct ancestors of modern Europeans, for example. This is something that people thought in the past, uh, but uh, they're also not completely detached from us. So when our ancestors migrated out of Africa, they actually encountered Neanderthals uh, on their way to Europe, Eurasia. And there is evidence that there was some interbreeding, so there was some exchange of genes. So even if they're not our direct ancestors, we do carry some genetic contributions from our Neanderthal cousins, so to speak. So it was able for humans and Neanderthals, Neanderthals to breed. I'm sorry, what was the question again? It, was, it is possible, it was possible for humans, homo sapiens, and Neanderthals to breed. Yes, and this is now a, a very, also a very active question because um, it seems to have been possible, but not, um, not very common and also not necessarily advantageous. So it was, um, of course, it's very hard to know exactly, yes, but what seems to be, uh, the evidence seems to be pointing at is that even if it happened, that this was um, carried some disadvantages for the, the hybrids uh, so that this was in the end rather limited in scope. So in fact, it is, this is a big discussion in biology in general. What, um, when, when we talk about vertebrates and mammals in particular, uh, of course, hybridization is a, an, a, a big topic and it happens quite a lot in other organisms like plants, for example. But it is also quite um, surprisingly frequent also among what is considered good species uh, among also mammals. So for example, it is known that um, primate 10 percent approximately 10 percent of primate species actually hybridize um, even in the wild so this is not un unheard of it's actually not uncommon and it's also been estimated that it's um, hybridization is more common when the species are the last common ancestor is relatively recent so when they haven't been separated for millions and millions of years but rather um, more recently, for example, yes. So uh, if we want to really follow strict biological species concept, and uh, I don't know if uh, this is something that uh, you were getting at, but one might say that this is not a different species, uh, but I think what the evidence is showing is that they are in the process of speciating. Certainly they're very different from a morphological point of view. So from an anatomical point of view, they would be considered a distinct species, if that makes sense. Anatomical. Okay. But in terms of genes, since they're able to breed, there are some similarities. Some... Exactly. And this is the this is the question, right? So for example, when they're actually uh, when we look at the genomes, the genetic evidence, what seems to have happened is um, there seems to be cleaning up of the modern human genome of um, Neanderthal uh, introgression. So it seems to be there's selection going on for removing these Neanderthal uh, genetic inputs, especially in areas where, um, especially in parts of the of the genome that are important for, for reproduction, such as, for example, genes that um, have something to do with testes or the X chromosome and so on. So this is where, or one of the indications why people think that there was um, 
that the hybrids were not as fit, um, that there was selection against this. Of course, there are some genetic, uh, there are some genes from Neanderthals that would have been advantageous to modern humans. And this is considered, for example, uh, genes that have to do with the immune system or hair and skin. Somehow this seemed to be perhaps useful for populations expanding into new environments, completely new habitats. So this is what we think. But uh, of course, it's also a lot of these uh, genetic, uh, this genetic input from Neanderthals has been selected against um, in later human evolution. Okay. Uh, so it seems that Neanderthals and humans coexisted. Do we know for how long? Do we know when Neanderthals became extinct? So this is uh, something that is also actively being researched. So Neanderthals uh, lived in Eurasia and modern human ancestors were uh, evolved in, in Africa. So they were around at the same time, but not at the same place, right? So when did they meet? So this is of course a question, how do we, when would they have met? And we can try to come at this question from different perspectives. We can try to make hypotheses from genetics, from ancient DNA. We can also look at the record, the archeological record and the fossil record and see, do we find them together, for example? From the fossil record, um, it is very difficult to find, we actually don't have sites uh, where we have the two of them living at the same time. So we don't have Neanderthal fossils and modern human fossils from the same place, from the same time. And also this is true in general, for regions. So there is no place where you have one site here and one site there at the same time exactly where you have Neanderthals and modern humans present in the same area. Uh, and this is actually a big discussion, in fact, uh, the exact chronology and the exact overlap. Uh, this, what happens now is the, the time that they would have met is when modern humans first arrive in Europe, yes? And we think they would have met in the Near East, Probably we have evidence from paleogenetics, or at least this is the hypothesis based on genetic data that they met at the very beginning of the expansion. But they would have met also, probably in Europe, we do have a hybrid individual um, with, uh, that we know from Romania with a recent ancestry so of Neanderthals, so a few generations before. So they would have met also in Europe. But the, the time of duration of this um, coexistence was probably very uh, short, only a few thousand years, and probably different in different parts of Europe. So again, Southeast Europe now plays an important role here because this would be the first entry point into the European continent. And indeed, this is where we find um, most of the evidence pertaining to such uh, hybridization. We find it in the Near East and we find it in uh, Eastern Europe or Southeast Europe. But of course, a lot is still unknown, and we don't know uh, we don't know the details for each particular region, right? So there is no reason why it should be the same across the board, and why this happened across the board. What we do know is that Neanderthals disappeared um, around forty thousand years ago, thirty nine thousand years ago. So whether they survived later in some places, like maybe in Greece, this we don't know. We don't have yet enough evidence to test this hypothesis. Uh, but they seem for all the sites that we know so far, the latest Neanderthals that are around uh, are dated to about 40,000 years ago. And the ones that you found in Apitima were 170,000 years ago. Yes, and, so and, this is actually gone. Sorry. And um, I was going to ask about the Homo sapiens, but tell me. So you asked before how they would have met, whether they would have met, and I told you about this last expansion of modern humans out of Africa, where we know that they met for sure. And now there's a question: Did they, of course, also meet earlier? And so our evidence now from Apidima actually is relevant for the an earliest expansion. So how do we know that there was an early expansion? Is there other evidence or is this Apidima skull 
the only evidence. And indeed, we've known for a long time that modern humans um, dispersed outside of Africa before 100,000 years ago, so already quite a lot earlier than about 40,000 years. I think I told you before that the, I'm not sure if I told you the date. So the last major expansion of Homo sapiens out of Africa happens around 50,000 years ago. And this is when they reach Europe and they eventually replace everyone around the world, right? But this seems to not have been the only uh, dispersal event, right? So we've known for a long time that even before 100,000 years ago, there were modern humans or early modern humans living in places like the Near East. And we've known this for, for decades. And recently, also from Israel, there was additional evidence of um, modern humans being around even at 180,000 years. So this has been well established that people, that modern humans already dispersed to the Near East, to the Eastern Mediterranean, already at a very early date, but for some reason did not then expand further, did not replace Neanderthals. And what seemed to happen is that Neanderthals then expanded south and um, replaced modern humans until the later event of expansion. So what our work shows is that it seems that this didn't, there is no reason, of course, also why did, why would early modern humans stop in Israel and not go further? And it seems that they actually uh, reached all the way to Greece already at around uh, 200,000 years ago. And this would be uh, further evidence for this early migration, that it reached even further than we thought before, and it was probably somewhat earlier. This actually fits rather well with paleogenetic data. There's been some indication from paleogenetics that there was also an interbreeding event between Neanderthals and the ancestors of modern humans already before 200,000 years ago. So was it in our case, for example, at Apidma, it's very hard to know because we found also Neanderthals at this site or a Neanderthal at this site, but it is dated to several thousand years later. So the dates that we currently have place the Neanderthal at Apidma at 170,000, whereas the early modern, the date that we have is placed at 200,000 and uh, 210 thousand years before present. So, of course, we need to do more research. We need to try to get more dates. We need to find more evidence to further test these ideas and see if we can say something more detailed. Is 210,000 years ago the, the, the earliest Homo sapiens that is found? In Eurasia, yes. In not in Africa. Mm -hmm. In Africa, we have the earliest members, recognized members of the Homo sapiens lineage going back to 300,000 years. Okay. Um, how did your team feel when you did, had this discovery in Apilima? Well, it's important to point out that we did not discover these specimens. They were actually already found many years ago. And this, um, this was um, work that was conducted uh, back in the 80s and late 70s and 1980s by the, a team from the University of Athens Medical School, that's the Museum of Anthropology. Uh, but these uh, specimens, these fossils had not been studied very extensively. And what we did, uh, we were invited by our colleagues at the Athens Medical School Museum of Anthropology to work on a collaborative project to really analyze these specimens and conduct, um, reconstruct uh, any uh, broken or damaged uh, parts and, and do a comparative analysis. And this is what we did. So our contribution was the uh, thorough analysis of these finds. Uh, your work also, also has to do with virtual anthropology methods, um, application of 3D, Geometric morphogenic, geometric morphometric, is that right? Yes. Um, can you explain uh, briefly what this means? Virtual anthropology is um, basically the application of uh, computer-assisted methods. Uh, a lot of them are derived from medical the medical sciences to the analysis of uh, the fossil record, basically. And it's usually uh, in conjunction with 3D geometric morphometrics, which is basically um, 
how, how to explain it, a quantitative analysis of shape, basically. So these are methods that provide uh, ways, provide tools uh, for uh, the better analysis and interpretation of the fossil record. For example, they enable one to reach uh, internal structures without damaging uh, the specimens. Uh, so for example, micro CT or high resolution CT scanning would be one of these methods, right? Applied in virtual anthropology. They enable um, putting together broken or damaged fossils in a virtual environment without uh, damaging the specimens themselves. They enable cleaning uh, specimens from a sediment matrix that can be very difficult to remove mechanically, uh, thereby uh, again revealing uh, parts of the fossils that were not accessible before. And of course, the shape of the 3D geometric metrics has to do with the statistical analysis of uh, three-dimensional variables. So really the comparative analysis of, of uh, anatomical shape. So this provides again, more powerful statistical tools for the interpretation of uh, even fragmentary uh, fossils that you may, uh, that one might find. It's important to note here that this is uh, necessary because fossils are not found perfect. Yes, if we, every time we found a fossil, if it was a complete individual, uh, perfectly preserved, um, our jobs would be very easy. But in fact, what we find are broken pieces, sometimes isolated teeth or isolated elements. And sometimes also things can be pretty complete, but they can be crushed or in other ways, taphonomically distorted. So this is where these methods are making things possible that were not possible before. So it will help to make even greater progress. Exactly. In, in the timing, all right. Okay, thank you. Uh, could you also, last question, tell me what science research is like in your country and the importance of bringing Mediterranean countries together through science? I'm sorry, I didn't hear the question. What, what science research is like in your country mm -hmm. and how important is it to bring Mediterranean countries, Mediterranean scientists together to work? So, okay, I think, are you referring now to Greece as my country or to Germany? Oh, really? You are? I am in Germany. My institution is in Germany. I don't okay. know if this is what you mean, but I think you mean Greece in this I, case. I, mean, yes. I thought it was Greece. I meant Greece. No, I am Greek, of course. Yes, yes. Um, okay, so... Uh, research in Greece, I mean, the paleoanthropology, uh, paleoanthropology is not uh, very developed in Greece. Uh, I think this is not um, somehow has to do with uh, traditional historical uh, consequences, for example, right? Archaeology uh, has been focused on later periods and paleoanthropology, it's not archaeology, but it's very, it's very tightly connected to Paleolithic archaeology. So it's, in fact, paleoanthropology is very interdisciplinary, right? So it's, by definition, it's a cross between paleontology, archaeology, and biology. So um, this, we don't have a very long tradition in, in this discipline in Greece, uh, but in the last um, 10 or 20 years, there have been increasing uh, increasing work on it and increasing interest. I think it's um, I think it's important to I think that the public and uh, the students are really interested and they want to know about it. So uh, it's it's good that we're finally learning something about the remote human past, let's say it in Greece. Uh, and I think, of course, if we look at other Mediterranean countries, of course, southern France, of course, Spain, uh, Italy, but of course, also the Near East and, and uh, Israel and even uh, northern Africa, there is actually quite a big, not only tradition, but a lot of evidence that has been recovered that has to do with uh, human evolution and the human fossil record. So Greece, in a way, is a bit of an outlier. Um, this somehow affects the countries that um, have been traditionally very strong in later periods in archaeology, for example, classical archaeology, because a lot of the research interest is devoted to later periods. And this is, of course, absolutely justified. Uh, for me, I think um, 
it is also an, uh, an opportunity, right? So it means that uh, perhaps there are discoveries that haven't yet been made and that are waiting to be, uh, to be made. And I think it's, um, it's, it, it's very nice. It would be very important to follow the example of other Mediterranean uh, countries and to actually, um, I, my view is and my belief is that there's quite a lot to be discovered and uh, I really hope that we can have more work in, in this discipline in, in Greece. Yes, very nice, yes. We are waiting for new, new findings. So thank you very much, Dr. Harvadi, for um, explaining your work to us. And no. congratulations for being part of the um, Mediterranean science team. And we will be um, checking out some new work. Wonderful. Thank you.